what I'm going to do to speak about today is, of course, social media analysis and artificial intelligence. By social media, I mean different kinds of platforms. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. You already are using probably different uh, platforms every day. And why? Why I think it's uh, useful? Because uh, I believe that they can facilitate participatory heritage management. And, uh, but who? Who really can benefit from this? There are many different stakeholders, including policymakers, heritage properties managers, tourism industry managers, and probably you, because you uh, already attend this workshop. And uh, when are we going to use this? Um, I think it really depends on the project and what's the goal of using social media. So according to that, we can use social media in different stages. But especially in the beginning of the project, it could be very useful for public inclusion. And uh, because uh, we can uh, know people and the uh, stakeholders that already uh, uh, give their opinions about that heritage property uh, on social media. And the last question is how? How are we going to use this? Uh, the rest of the workshop is uh, I'm trying to answer this question. Let's just start with the concept of uh, values and attributes. Uh, if you're working on a heritage field, probably you are already aware of these concepts and probably familiar with them. But um, just to, well, for, I will give you a small review for those who are not uh, familiar with the concepts. Um, heritage is recently defined as attributes and values. And while attributes are answering to the question of what, what is important, what should be preserved, values are answering to the question of why, why these attributes are important, why they should be preserved. And answering to these questions are very important because by specifying the attributes and values, we are, uh, we are distinguishing the limitation of change in heritage management. And in this way, we can integrate development and preservation uh, much more easier. Uh, for example, imagine that you decide that a specific building is an important attribute and it should be preserved. And then you decide that, okay, this is important because of the age value, for example. Then you know what quality and what, what aspects of the building you should not change because it affects that historic value. And the others that affect other values that you recognize that are not that important, you can change. So this is a very important step. But the problem is that lots of documents and uh, mostly documents doesn't provide values and attributes like clearly, you know, implicitly. So we need to, we need to find them out and kind of, and, and a way could be coding. We can code the attributes and values uh, through the text. Uh, this is why our research group, uh, the HEVA group uh, at TU Delft, uh, present this workshop uh, of three to four, between three to four hours, uh, explaining the concepts of values and attributes and the coding technique. Of course, I won't be able to cover this in my workshop, but I will give you uh, just a taste of uh, this to make you, make you more familiar. We use uh, two frameworks. We use, uh, in the left hand, you see the theoretical framework we use for uh, values. Uh, this is initially um, developed by Anna, Professor Anna Ferrer Roders. It has nine different classes of values, ecological, social, economic, age, political, scientific, aesthetical, historic, and others. We use this framework because it has clear definitions for all, each of the classes and also the subclasses. And for coding technique, we really need to have a clear definition. And for the attributes we use, uh, the other framework that you see in the right uh, hand, and uh, this one is developed by Professor Luzfeld Haas. And as you see, the main classes of attributes are intangible and tangible. With intangible, we have asset area and all, and within intangible, we have asset related societal and process. Uh, 
Again, we use this framework because it has definition for each of the groups and each of the subgroups. So uh, I won't uh, have to, I don't have time to explain this more, but I created this game for you. It has two questions. So I appreciate if you go to the kahoots.it uh, with your mobile phone or uh, I don't know uh, in which way you prefer. And then uh, we can play this game. It has two questions. In the first question, I will ask you to recognize the values. And in the second question, I will ask you to recognize the attributes in the same uh, phrase. So I hope you, uh, you are now all uh, familiar with the, these concepts, just uh, to have something in mind for the rest of the presentation. Um, after we uh, analyze the class of values and attributes throughout many different uh, documents, we can see uh, what are the most frequent and important values that are addressed by uh, that document. And then we can come up with the redesign and management guidelines. And we can have this systematic uh, process of heritage management. Um, of course, you can uh, use this coding method for many different uh, documents that uh, are related to different stakeholders. For example, local policy documents, national policy documents, international policy documents, it can be state-of-the-art literature, and even interviews that you had done with those specific stakeholders that uh, were important for you. But in my project, I decided to work on social media. Social media can be a very uh, helpful resource when you don't have, when you want to have the opinion of general public or a specific stakeholder that have uh, shared its, uh, their opinion on social media. And when there is no available data source, uh, no one had did this field study uh, according to these um, groups of stakeholders. Um, and also, when, uh, when you don't have um, access or you don't have the funding or time to do this field work yourself and to collect this data yourself. So let's go uh, to the social media analyzers. I will start by uh, explaining the steps and tools. Um, first of all, I should mention that um, this is uh, what I'm presenting today is part of my PhD project. Um, the case study, is case study is located in the historic city of Yaz in Iran that was inscribed on UNESCO list in 2017. I uh, decided to work on this case study because uh, part of my um, uh, funding for my PhD is provided by the University of Yaz. Also, Yaz is my hometown, so I know a lot about uh, the city. And within the city, I decided to work on wind catchers because wind catchers are uh, attributes with uh, outstanding universal, recognized as outstanding universal values uh, in UNESCO. And uh, they are the symbol of the city of Yaz. Actually, city of Yaz is called the city of wind catchers because of the numerous wind catchers uh, this city have. And, um, and wind catchers are important for many different stakeholders. So they are important for tourists because they are unique and they make such a beautiful skyline for the city. They are important for residents because lots of houses in the historic city has at least one wind catcher. So they need to deal with this. They need to take actions. Uh, and they are also important for experts, mostly because of their function as passive ventilation systems. Uh, they circulate the air through the house and um, they don't use uh, any fossil energy. And lots of uh, modern wind catchers are uh, built in spite from um, these traditional wind catchers. Uh, so as you see, there are uh, many different values that different people uh, attach to wind catchers. But uh, it wasn't clear for me which groups attach which uh, values and attributes to the wind catchers. And there was no available resource on um, the opinion of general public on wind catchers. So this is why I decided to use social media as a resource um, to find the opinion of uh, people about wind catchers. 
Um, these are the steps of uh, my project. Of course, I start with data aggregation. First, uh, I started with finding out the platforms that uh, provide the most relevant uh, data um, about uh, my uh, project. And then when I found that I used, of course, different tools that they uh, provided, you know, uh, I, uh, used, I searched by location, by hashtags, by users and so on. Um, then when I found uh, my relevant data and the relevant uh, social media platforms, then I aggregate the data. Then I uh, did data pre-processing and data cleaning. This is a very important step because we need to remove our, all the unnecessary data. For example, it really differs, uh, depends on the project, but, but in my project was, for example, the punctuation marks and emojis. And uh, for data pre-processing also, there are different um, actions to do, but one of the most important ones was, um, uh, was normalization of the text. So it's very important, uh, especially in social media, because, uh, for example, if I want to say, I love this building, I, not necessarily, I don't necessarily say, I love this building. Sometimes I say, I love this building with lots of O between L and V. So it's important to normalize all the words in one form for the latter analysis. And then I created this database, including all the pre-processed and clear data. And then I created a, an embedding, and then I started the um, text classification. So here I brought just some of the examples that I did. I kept the, I classified my text based, based on the value and attribute frameworks that I just uh, presented. I uh, classified them based on the sentiment, based on the emotion and feeling that people uh, uh, address, based on the user type. I had uh, the two different user types, which I'm going to explain the next slide. And of course, dates, because you want to see, for example, how the different things has changed uh, during uh, the period that you are uh, investigating. And after I did this text classification analysis, I visualized it and I started uh, comparing them together. So I used different tools for text classification models. That uh, was my um, fourth step. I had, uh, I used Python. Of course, you need um, a programming language. And uh, I selected Python because it has uh, really helpful packages and libraries for uh, text mining. Um, I code the values and classifications of values for those who uh, are more technical, are more interested into uh, technical stuff. I use BERT model for the embedding and cosine similarity methods for the embedding proximity. I code the attributes using name and title recognition model and dependency parsing method. And uh, I specify the user type. I classify, I had two different classes for uh, my uh, user, um, user types. The first one, I distinguished Iranians from foreigners because I wanted to see how, uh, how the opinions of locals and foreigners uh, has changed um, or different. And also I uh, classified them uh, to a group of general and to a group of tourist professionals. Tourist professionals are the groups that use uh, social media. Uh, their social media page is, and all the posts that they share there is um, related to their business. They are not, uh, yeah. And uh, I did it based on the language and location that they share in their post or in their bio. Uh, and also I did emotional analysis and sentiment analysis. I used MySQL to create a relational database. And I used ClickView to get queries and visualize uh, my data. I created um, a short um, video on uh, myself using ClickView to uh, show you how you can use the environment. And uh, of course, it's not... Uh, it's just um, to give you a taste of uh, the environment. And uh, yeah. Uh, so first I uh, started uh, to make a chart 
I um, selected the title. I want to see how uh, how different values, how different um, uh, values are frequent. So this is about the frequency of values uh, in general. And then here I um, selected the dimensions that um, I want to calculate. Of course, the dimension is the value. And here I wrote uh, the code, uh, uh, the yeah, the calculation formula. And then I'm done. Uh, I have my uh, diagram. And as you see, for example, uh, overall, uh, the age value is the most frequent value. Oops, sorry. But I wanted to see um, how this changed during the year. So I wanted to see if, for example, in 2017, that the city was inscribed, if uh, what was the most frequent value that is uh, addressed in that year. So I try to compare them. I filter um, my uh, diagram based on the year. At first, I see 2020. Again, age is the most frequent one, and then I have the historic value. But then I try to see how it changed in 2017. And as you see, in 2017, the historic value was the most addressed value. And uh, this was very interesting for me to see how I mean, the, um, the potential relationship between uh, inscription, inscription of the city and the historic value. Um, so uh, the other uh, software that I used is uh, Gephi, of course, for a uh, network analysis. Uh, for Gephi also, I created a very uh, small video to uh, show you the environment. Um, so this is the this is the uh, data set, and uh, this is the, the data set that includes the nodes. The nodes uh, have ID, label, and category. Of course, for me, category are uh, attributes and the classes of values. That's um, I talked about it uh, in the first part. For example, old city. The category of old city is age. Uh, because it belongs to, it's uh, addressing the age value. Okay. And then uh, I have uh, the attributes, uh, I have, sorry, the edges. I have the relationship between uh, these words, how common they are repeated together. So the weight shows how common these words are repeated together. For example, wind catcher and building are repeated together 17 times, while wind catcher and air are repeated together 91 times. So then I go and see my uh, network. Of course, it's a huge messy network, so I need to filter it. So I wanted to see um, only the words that are associated with at least uh, seven other words. And uh, this is the network I have. And then I wanted to specifically see how city relates to different words. And you see that the strongest relationship, for example, here is between the city and uh, wind catcher. Uh, so I hope you get uh, some, um, um, you inspired from this and get how, and, uh, how this can be helpful in uh, your project. Uh, I'm going to give you some uh, small results of my uh, project uh, to see how I can uh, use this uh, in heritage management. So the first one is uh, uh, the general trend of, um, of uh, the number of posts and users during the years. And I noticed that I had this huge jump in 2017 and this drop in 2020, I tried to find out the important events that has happened in the city. And um, I, I think this is, of course, my interpretation. Uh, and uh, I, I think in the inscription of the city in 2017 um, has, uh, um, has uh, affected this uh, jump. And in 2020, the worldwide pandemic uh, due to the COVID um, affected this uh, drop in the number of posts and users. 
And uh, it shows how the inscription of the city in UNESCO list can, can motivate, probably motivate people to be more active uh, about the uh, heritage property in social media. And, uh, and how uh, tourism industry, because, the, because of the COVID, uh, we didn't have, uh, the tourism industry was very limited. So probably tourism industry had um, also affected uh, people activity about the heritage site in social media. But uh, the interesting point is that still in 2020, the numbers are more than in 2016, just before the city was inscribed. So it seems that the city's inscription in the UNESCO has a more stronger uh, effect. And then um, the other result was, of course, about uh, classification of values and attributes. Um, in order to make it more tangible for you, I here are brought uh, two exemplary quotes. I'm going to read the first one loud. Uh, we are visiting one of the most beautiful viewpoints in the world. From Art House, you can see a panoramic view of Yaz and its magic wind catcher and dog. So uh, my AI, the AI logic of my model recognized uh, the aesthetic model, the aesthetic sorry value in this uh, quote because it's the, because of the word. And it's recognized the, um, the attributes you see, viewpoint, panoramic view of yes, wind catcher, and dump. Uh, so uh, this is how uh, it works and how I classified attributes uh, and class of values. And then I wanted to see exactly the thing I showed you uh, that I created in quick view. I wanted to see what was the most important value according to the social media users about wind catchers. And, um, and as you see, age and historic values were the most uh, important and addressed value for them. And uh, so it really affects uh, our, um, you know, uh, the guideline, the pre redesign guideline. Because um, then, pro and, and on the other hand, we see that the political and scientific values are the least important ones. So if we want to uh, manage our redesign guideline based on this, uh, we should uh, save uh, and preserve those parts that affect uh, age and historic values. But on the other hand, probably we can remove those parts that affect political value. I wanted to see how different users um, relate to these uh, values and if there is any difference. So I saw that um, while there are, there are lots of similarities, Iranian refers to a historic value more than foreigners, while foreigner refer to economic value more than Iranian. And again, this is my interpretation, but I believe this can be because Iranians are more aware of the historic uh, history of the city. And uh, this is why uh, they address it more. And uh, on the other hand, um, as I said, wind catchers are passive ventilation systems, so they don't use any fossil energy. And energy is very cheap in Iran compared to many other countries. And probably this is why the economic value, the financial value of wind catcher is more important to foreigners than Iranian. Um, what else I did is that I tried to find out the relation between uh, the attributes and values uh, and that are related to wind catchers. So I collected all the attributes that are uh, mentioned in the post that are associated and are talking about uh, each value of wind catchers. So for example, this one are all the attributes um, uh, that uh, are mentioned in the posts that uh, were related to the aesthetical value of wind catchers. I created such word cloud for all of the values. And uh, the interesting point that I found out was that, uh, as you see in the first row, the aesthetical age and historic value, the, one of the main attributes in them is city. 
while in the second role for ecological, scientific, and economic uh, values, uh, an important uh, attribute is building. So this means that if we want to, um, for example, uh, preserve the ecological value, if we finally uh, understood that ecological value is the most important value, then, uh, then by preserving only the building, we are preserving the ecological value according to these users. And it's not important if we preserve, for example, the skyline, the relation between uh, that the wind catcher, different wind catchers together, and uh, whatever the relation between the city and wind catchers mean. Um, also, as I mentioned, I uh, investigated the feelings, the sentiments, and um, I almost had no negative or very negative uh, sentiments, which was quite interesting uh, because in lots of uh, heritage properties, uh, it's kind of the opposite. And I also analyzed the emotions. And then I wanted to see if there is a relationship between emotions and the values. If people associate certain emotions to certain values, so I get this query and I understood that uh, when people talk about aesthetical value, which is more softer than the other values, they address the feeling of joy rather than the others. And while they refer to more maybe harder value, uh, values like ecological, economic, and scientific, they address trust more than the other values. And uh, of course, there should be more research uh, to prove this, but this was very interesting for me that they kind of, uh, there is some relations apparently between these emotions that, feel, uh, that people address to uh, different values, different groups of values. So I know that uh, I talked a lot about many different results and this was just part of the work, but uh, I, brought them all together here. And so I talked about the frequent values and then the main uh, attributes that each of the values uh, were uh, related, of course, except for wind catchers, and the sentiment that are mentioned in the post that, uh, that describing that value and the emotion, the emotion that they were um, exp uh, expressing. Of course, I did lots of other uh, results, um, but uh, yeah, let me know if you're in interested, please uh, contact me via uh, email. And now uh, this is time for discussion. So I want to know how do you think that you can use social media analysis in your field right now? And why do you think that it's important? And who do you think that will benefit from it and when? So um, let's have discussion. And if you like, uh, it would be very nice to uh, see your uh, faces as well. And uh, I hope that we have a nice discussion. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Perhaps Hi. I'm going to start. <laughs> but, uh, I guess. That's yes. very brave. <laughs> Yeah, actually, my question is or uh, idea how to use social media is to totally different field. It's about, of course, cultural heritage management, but uh, uh, could this kind of uh, approach to be used, for example, to find out what kind of uh, well, content we should digitize and publish so mm -hmm. and to get reaction and impact and to analyze, for example, impact of our uh, content online yeah. through social media reactions. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very, very nice question. So what I did was kind of passive public participation. So there were information there, I just grabbed them and uh, analyzed them. But another approach uh, indeed is what you mentioned. But um, mostly, it's uh, it could be risky, so it's in, or maybe it should be a you know big project, and you should attract people to your social media page or the hashtag that you created and ask people to react uh, using these hashtags. But
but um, yeah, but I know that there are lots of projects that they, they do this. They ask people to react on the project that has been done. Uh, we are using a specific hashtags and maybe they kind of motivate people by uh, giving, you know, promising some uh, gifts and so on. But uh, yes, indeed, this is, um, this is an, a, a very nice approach. Okay, thanks. <laughs> somehow in your project or no? <laughs> uh, well, we are just thinking that could this be done somewhere, somehow, but of course, it's really, really big project. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yes. It should be big to motivate people. Otherwise, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> could give some really interesting results because, of course, we are trying to get people to get involved in our management yes. of our heritage and this could yeah. be one way to do that yeah yeah it's, it's always tricky to get people motivated to um yeah to participate it's a lot yeah. easy but um yeah, yeah. It's just a way <laughs> thank, yeah, <but> thank you <laughs> and for starting this <laughs> Noor, I saw that you uh, mentioned in the chat that you are uh, working on uh, heritage and post-conflict recovery. I wonder if um, why you are interested in social media and if you have something in your mind that uh, you can use um, in your work. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's uh, really a very good uh, start for my thinking. I am still in the early stages of my PhD and uh, as you might uh, uh, know, um, apart from the pandemic, the conflict places are very risky to travel to. Yeah. So I was uh, thinking if I needed to uh, study the uh, values like what people think of their heritage or the values that people attribute to their heritage uh, what was the best way uh, to do it uh, uh, from uh, from uh, from far away not going on site so i think yeah. this could be uh, a, a point from where to, to to think to start the problem is that i am not in the it so i have no idea about all these programs you were talking about <laughs> No, I know. Yeah, that's true. Actually, I didn't have any knowledge about coding and programming before. So I've started self-learning myself, but um, I believe it's uh, it works it. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's, of course, uh, a lot to do and, and learn. Uh, but uh, but it's, they, they provide us uh, very uh, powerful tools and uh, yeah and really it's um you know you can analyze lots of things in many different ways and it's much faster than doing it manually and uh, i am i yeah. am not sure of any of these uh, are already published if any of this work is already published uh, as a report or paper or, or something to have a, a more in-depth look on it um, thank you. I'm I'm working on it, <laughs> so it's uh, working for us. Uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, 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 mail me and uh, we'll be in touch. Um, um, I, I can send you some uh, resources uh, about this. Uh, thank you. I would appreciate that. And no worries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but what you mentioned is very important. The COVID was also one of. Um, the main motivation for me as well to really use the social media because there was no way uh, doing this uh, by myself. And the other thing is that, for example, I didn't have access to the tourists that has visited the city for the last 10 years, you know? So, but, but, but in social media, they, uh, they mentioned their emotions and, uh, and uh, expressed their opinions. So, um, and, and no other studies had um, researched on it. So sometimes you, you, you can't do anything. <laughs> you don't have access to that uh, information that you want. And um, then social media is very handy, of course. Thank you, Anura, for, um, yeah, for giving your opinion. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, uh, I see that De uh, Denisa also said that uh, I think I can use the method 
in researching on sites in Facebook for people who are looking for uh, traveling destinations and activities they look for or are engaging at the time of pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Um, and discover Milan, um, sorry, discover uh, Manila um, that features places, sites, food, and I can relate the attributes um, to the value. Yeah, museum, museums and their motion uh, when they visit the museum before and after lockdown. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a very nice thing to do to see, to compare uh, how it changed uh, after and before COVID or in my work, for example, before, before the inscription and after the inscription, as you saw, that uh, historic value suddenly was very important uh, when the city was inscribed. That was um, quite shocking for me that uh, people starting talking about historic value uh, much more um, than uh, before. Uh, Federica, I see that uh, you said that you are um, now working in a master's university in uh, cultural policy and management. Uh, I'm really curious to know how you think that you can use social media in your work if you uh if you had so uh, some ideas so far or or if you get some ideas now by any chance <laughs> uh no actually it was just curiosity i've just finished uh, my okay thesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've just finished my thesis on the relationship between uh, museums and the sustainable development and i yes. think that uh, uh, social media uh, can play an important role in the promotion of uh, uh, maybe uh, sustainability, sustainable yeah. practices applied, for example, on uh, museum collections uh, or yeah, on communities. But uh, I repeat, it was just uh, a pure curiosity. <laughs> yeah, oh, nice. Curio everything starts with curiosity, I believe. <laughs> Very nice uh, to have you here. I don't know. Did you um, did you get what you wanted or? Not fully, I don't know. Um, did you get some ideas for the future? Oh, yes, I think, um, for example, also not only for museums, but as in your case, for the promotion of a, a cultural heritage site, or also maybe a natural heritage site, I think, uh, yeah, um, you just explained to us a, a really good practices. Okay, nice. I'm, I'm happy to hear this. Uh, yes, contact me if you have, uh, I don't know, if you wanted to use it later on and you have uh, any questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for, um, yeah, for standing up and talking. Thank you. Hello, Martha. First of all, Hi, thank Marie. you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's indeed very interesting, this topic the social media. Uh, the question that I have is that how can we extract the data? I mean, like I joined the presentation quite later, maybe you have already mentioned it, but my main question is that how like you can extract the raw data from, is, is it based yeah. on scale? Like how do you distinguish them or? Yes, yes, sure, yeah. Uh, thank you, Moin, uh, for, yeah, for your question. Um, so, um, it, it really depends on uh, the platform that you want to uh, work with and you want uh, the, the data uh, of that platform, but um, you can uh, buy the APIs, of course, in this way, for example, the API of uh, Instagram, in this way you can uh, have all the data from, you know, from the first year, for example, if you want to and know, uh, have all the posts with a specific hashtag. If you buy the API from Instagram, they will uh, provide you with all the posts from the very beginning uh, with that hashtag. Uh, but I know that uh, there are also other softwares. Um, for example, Web Harvey is uh, one of them. Um, uh, yeah, but, uh, but, but it really depends. Thank you so much. Yeah, for so Dennis asked about uh, yeah for the database. Um, I used uh, MySQL. I will uh, write this down here. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, it's um, it's a very common um, the, the um, thing for you um, for creating your database, um, especially if you're working with a relational database. It's very um, helpful. And uh, the quick view that I uh, presented was also super helpful. It was uh, very uh, handy, and uh, you could uh, I couldn't explain much more, but uh, you could really play with it, filter it, and uh, um, uh, see uh, and experiment with it, uh, many different things. It was a uh, very uh, nice software. Um, so Ismo asked if I can use, um, if I can get data from these apps uh, using a story only. Mm. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm not sure, Ismo, if I uh, understand your uh, question uh, correctly. Yeah, I can uh, perhaps explain. So <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, not using hashtags as search queries, <laughs> but for example, if uh, somebody published something on Facebook or Twitter or oh, yeah. uh, Instagram and using this text, for example, let's say Europeana or yeah. Finnish Heritage Agency, not as hashtags. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Can gotcha. you use this? Uh, your... Yes, I got yeah. it. So it's, um, yeah, it's a good question, actually. Yeah, uh, very practical. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it really depends uh, on the platform that um, you, you want to work with. So, uh, for example, in Instagram, you can also, um, so I, I think in Twitter, you can do this. You can search uh, without hashtags. Um, in Twitter, I know that you can search with uh, location. You can also, like, for example, um, because of what you said earlier, for example, maybe you have your own Instagram page and um, you want to see, uh, get all the comments that people um, mention uh, in each post. You can um, get them and search them and get them. But, uh, but in Instagram, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure 100%, but I think you can't um, search by just a word. Um, yeah, you need hashtags or locations or a specific username. Um, still, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that this is, for example, possible in Twitter. So it's, uh, it really depends on uh, the platform and uh, the rule is simple, so if you can, search if you can uh, it, it really depends on the uh, the what uh, these platforms provide for searching if they uh, if you can search in uh, instagram with just uh, a board then then you can um, extract and aggregate data uh, based on that but if you can't search uh, with a word then probably you can't uh, get the data um, based on just uh, yeah a word <laughs> thank you, Gina. Thank you all for attending the workshop. I hope uh, you all enjoy. And um, please um, contact me via email if you have any other questions or if I can help uh, with anything. <laughs>